Hello, my friends, Evolutionary Energy Arts family. So we're going to start taking a look at Hurricane Hector. And Hector appears to be on the way to Hawaii. And so, as we see here, uh, basically they're urging the citizens to prepare. As we take a look at the cone, and we <clears throat> see that it looks as if it would be there sometime on Wednesday p.m. or in the general vicinity. Right now it has it going, the cone going just over the southernmost point of the Big Island. And we'll see how this develops. Um, as this is, you know, something uh, Hawaii, I'm sure, doesn't really need right now is have a hurricane come along, especially hitting the Big Island there. And uh, as it says here, as if the ongoing Kilauea volcano eruption isn't enough for Hawaii, the state now faces the potential impact of a storm with Hurricane Hector's path, bringing it near the islands in the latest forecast update. Already, the state's emergency management agency has issued a warning for residents and telling them to hold 14 days of rations just in case. And that's always a good idea anyway. Hector is currently a significant storm, a Category 3, with winds of 120 miles per hour as of early Saturday morning. It was about 1,600 miles east of the Big Island of Hawaii at 2 a.m. Pacific time Saturday, moving in a westerly line. The movement put Hector's forecast path very close to the southern tip of the Hawaiian Islands by midweek, and it's possible the hurricane's path could shift north towards the state, threatening at least parts of it. It all depends on the way the wind flows. And when we take a look at this on Ventusky, you get an idea, and, and it's even a little bit more ominous when we look at Ventusky. Every time I look at the Pacific over here, it's, there's just this. This is Wednesday. So that is Hector. And then, what do we got? We have two more right behind it. Uh, so this is what I was talking about. There's this weird pattern uh, that we have seen out in the Pacific where it just is kind of churning storms in the same spot, same spots I should say, they keep popping up and of course they don't head in exactly the same line but this is kind of ominous <clears throat> because you know here this is the general flow and we'll see how it, how it goes and how it develops. So this is what we're looking at on Wednesday and so, if we go out a little bit farther, and, you know, of course, these things could change. I mean, you're seeing these two behind it looking pretty significant. As we go Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Hector's moved on past and is still, you know, a, a solid looking storm. And then we have these two behind it just kind of hanging there. And what's going to happen with those? We don't know at this point. All going to depend on the currents. But if we're looking out all the way to the 13th, which, you know, this could be so drastically changed, realistically, we have another storm heading towards Hawaii. And again, it depends on the wind flows. So we'll definitely have to keep an eye on this. And then, of course, then you have, what is Hector? moving on over this way. As we've seen, these storms just continually, continually develop over here as well. And when we look out in the Atlantic, it's, it, there's nothing. There's really nothing. Uh, you got some winter storms brewing down low, um, but it's, it's really quiet. And uh, the Atlantic has been colder. And it's very, very interesting watching all these these things, you know. Um, so we will keep our eye on it and we will hope for the best for Hawaii. And there's a lot of weird things going on. I mean, we've, we've seen all these crazy storms and uh, you guys might have seen this. Uh, this this was a huge, massive, 5,000 foot high wall of dust engulfing the Phoenix here <coughs> area, 70, 70 miles wide. 5,000 feet high. And I'll let you guys play the videos and you can catch the time lapse and everything. Just epic, um, biblical, sure.
You know, just it, it looks like we're looking at like an old school Cecil B. DeMille film or maybe the old mummies. I'm really going to date myself with the uh, Cecil B. B. DeMille thing. That's actually not even my generation. It's actually more my mother's and father's. And so, as we have seen, you know, it's just been wild and crazy ride lately. We have a mysterious fireball exploding with the power of a small nuclear bomb above a U.S. base in Greenland, puzzling NASA scientists. Well, maybe it's puzzling them. Maybe they know what it is and they're just not going to say. A mysterious fireball exploding with the power of a small nuclear bomb, which was detected not far from a U.S. air base in Greenland, has alerted a NASA space explorer. Another called for a calm, saying it's not a Russian strike. The curious tweet was released by Ron Balki, a space explorer at NASA's JPL lab. In late July, a fireball was detected over Greenland on July 25th, 2018, by U.S. government sensors at an altitude of 43.3 kilometers. He wrote, the energy from the blast was estimated to be at 2.1 kilotons. Pretty wild. The information about the cosmic flotsam was also bugged, also bugged researcher Hans Christensen, a director of the Nuclear Information Project at the Federal Aviation of American Scientists. He said that the meteor exploded above missile early warning radar at Thule Air Force Air Base, the northernmost U.S. base that has operated on the island since the 1940s. Now this is very, very curious, and this feels just like a strange sci-fi movie, you know? Why did it happen to explode <laughs> above the missile early warning radar at that base. Uh, is this like a signal from outer space? Or are we supposed to take this as a sig signal that the aliens are testing our defenses or giving us a, a warning shot over the bow? Is that how it's supposed to be? Is this the beginning of the Project Blue Beam fake invasion? Um, what do you think? What do you guys make of this? This is really curious. Uh, or maybe it's just my imagination running with it because I've seen this in too many sci-fi movies the scientists didn't pass up the opportunity for the Russians did it joke we're still here so they correctly concluded it wasn't a Russian first strike he wrote noting that there are nearly 2,000 nukes on alert ready to launch Cryptic fireball buzzing through the sky above a U.S. base in Greenland puzzles NASA scientists. Kristen's followers, however, didn't breathe a sigh of relief. The other way around, the message triggered tweets from puzzled people. Meteor explodes with a 2.1 kiloton force, 43 kilometers above an early warning missile base? I mean, come on. What could that be? And then this one says, forgive me, am I understanding that you're tweeting correctly that this meteor has been incorrectly identified? It, or if it had been, it would have triggered the launch of 2,000 nukes? So, yeah, and this one says, one day soon we're going to all die from a miscalculation. So, are we meeting our maker? So the meteor was indeed, indeed big, and I hope it wasn't another military freak test we're getting a lot of weird stuff you know there's a lot of weird stuff going on and so we know all about all these things we've heard for years all you guys out there that are uh, I won't say the conspiracy theorists we're, we're truthers and we want to get to the truth and we know that there is um, all sorts of diversions, all so, sorts of obvious lies and cover-ups. And then there's stuff that's BS that they feed into us to, to get us to think down a certain line of thought. And, and try to think that they are always, you know, several steps ahead of the masses for sure. And so even with the people that are awake to what's really going on, well, those, those would probably be the people that they want to 
know they're going to get their attention, but try to misdirect them or try to get them to think along a, a certain lines. So what's this all about? What is this all about? Hmm, was it really a mysterious fireball? Did it ever even happen at all? You know, because you have to wonder sometimes, you know, who's giving you the info, what they're leaking. Did it really even happen at all? Was it an asteroid coming in? Are we getting into an area again where we're going to see massive asteroid inundation? And is that a harbin harbinger of something to come? Is it really part of maybe the bigger war that's going on out there? Because many of you believe that there's a war going on out there. Some of you believe it's angels and demons fighting. And some of you believe it's uh, Pleiadians and Draco fighting or, or the Anunnaki fighting. And some believe the Anunnaki fight amongst themselves with different factions of the Anunnaki uh, at war with other factions. Uh, or is this, you know, maybe was it, was it a test by the Russians or the Chinese or something? Who knows? Is this, is this part of selling the Sky Force, Space Force, you know, President Trump's new branch of the military? That is happening. That is happening. So, could this be, and and that's, I'm feeling ding, ding, ding with that. Could this be a, a reason to sell us the need for a space force? Because who knows what's out there? Who knows what's right around the corner? Who knows what we're going to see in our skies? Are we going to wake up and look outside someday and see thousands of ships in the sky? So many ships you can't even count them. Well, it's it's pretty interesting because, I mean, honestly, when I was reading in the Bible and I was reading about the day of the Lord, and um, that is the picture that came in my mind, and I all of a sudden clicked with me, and I thought, oh, yeah, that would make perfect sense. Perfect sense. If you reread that, and you see that as an alien invasion with, you know, God actually being an E.T., then, yeah return of God and, you know, alien invasion and, and that whole scenario would make sense because, yes, if we did look up and see tens of thousands of ET ships all way more advanced than our, our technology or supposedly our level of technology and they were everywhere, all over the sky, yes, the whole earth would wail and moan. We, everybody would be terrified, especially if our government was saying that we don't know who they are. And uh, we don't know if they're hostile or not. And yeah, that would, that would definitely make perfect sense for everything that was written in the Bible about the day of the Lord. And, you know, when God will come and rule on earth totally in front of us, in person. And uh, if somebody didn't come and bring them their, their tithes and their respects, then, the God, then God would shut off the... The rain to that part of the world that those people were in. So their land would wither and die if they weren't being properly obedient. <clears throat> so that all hit me. And, uh, and that's part of our programming. That's part of the programming that we've been sold. And it's been in us because it's been taught in our religious institutions. It's been part of our culture. Our sci-fi culture, you know, I mean, all since the Roswell incident and the, uh, the flying saucers. But, you know, if you look back farther, it's always been there. Do you realize that back in the uh, 18, late 1800s, there was all these sightings of UFOs that look like blimps, you know, like zeppelins and stuff. And so it seems like we see almost what we want to see. And perhaps none of it's really even so much physical at all, but really interdimensional and uh, illusions. You know, all of it is illusions. And it's interesting that I feel like so many people don't buy into some of the lies. They, well, they don't buy into all the lies, but they'll buy into some of the lies. And they can't see past um, all the conditioning that they've received. So I think that they're on their way to understanding how really this has been a huge illusion and a misdirection that has been put on us since the beginning. And so, 
you can see what, what's going on, what's being set up. It, it's really very clear to see, and so it's a, it's a big puzzle. <laughs> as, as the U.S. scientists are puzzled over what was this mysterious fireball, it, the whole thing is a big puzzle. And I hope that I'm not losing you guys uh, in my train of thought here. So another very curious incident that we see one after another after another as we're into all these crazy earth changes that we're seeing all over. And, and it's not just that. That's just part of this. There, there's so much more going on. Unusually high seawater temperature forces Swedish nuclear power plant to close. And so this is really interesting in and of, of itself as well. So we, we know that they've been experiencing in the Arctic Circle temperatures 90 degrees. That's pretty, oh, that's pretty intense. And so unusually high seawater temperature has forced a Swedish nuclear power plant to close, authorities said on Monday, as the water reached a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Wildfires are not the only consequence of the warmest July since temperature measurement began in Sweden in 1756. The Swedish state-owned power company Vattenfall was forced to close one of its reactors in the Ringels nuclear power plant on Monday. Ringels is the largest, or Ringhals, is the largest nuclear plant in the Nordics and accounts for a fifth of all the electricity consumed in Sweden. The plant has two old reactors, Ringhals 1 and 2, and two new ones, 3 and 4. Seawater is used to cool the reactors, and every reactor has a limit for how high the temperature of the water can get before it has to be taken offline for safety. So, for this one in question, number two, the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, which has now been surpassed in the area. When we saw the temperatures approaching 25 degrees Celsius on Monday, we chose to limit the effect to 55%, but now the temperature exceeds 25 degrees, so we have taken it off off of productions. So, sea temperatures this high are unusual in Sweden. During the 21st century, this is the second time a nuclear power plant is closed for the same reason. And as you know, if you've watched my videos, I'm not a big proponent of that. Uh, I just feel it's too much of a ticking time, Tom, time bomb. So, this is interesting. Um, VLA detects possible extrasolar planetary mass magnetic powerhouse. This is more than interesting. Um, this is really something that I feel is such a, this, this is just such a leak. You know, there's no way around this. The object is at a boundary between a giant planet and a brown dwarf. So <clears throat> this is so much of what we've been thinking about when we're talking about Nibiru for so long. There's been so much speculation, so much, you know, possibilities of what type of a mass it would take out there. And so, again, think about the timing and think about, like, everything we're going through. So is this... You know, you, is it part of disclosure or is it part of the bigger picture that they actually want to sell us? And or maybe it is actually real. They're admitting what is real. Um, but just look at the timing on all this stuff coming out, right? I mean, we have that strange blast that, that's nuclear in origin. Now we have them talking about this object that is a boundary, at a boundary between a giant planet and a brown dwarf. Look at the color. You know, this is what we've been kind of expecting in so many ways, um, many of us. And so they're giving us all the things we need to believe in the whole Nibiru Planet X uh, timeline, as well as much, much more. You know, everything that is coming together is, is, is just convincing people. It's convincing the Nibiru Planet X believers, you know, the ancient alien believers. It's convincing the people that believe in, um, you know, uh, biblical fundamentalism and, and the fact that we are in the end times. We are in now <coughs> um, 
the tribulation itself, you know, as many people believe that we entered the tribulation with the eclipse last August. And honestly, I mean, that's what it felt like to me. It felt like for sure it's like all of the tribulation stuff clicked on as soon as we hit that time period. Because we see a totally different, you know, world that we're living in now. Everything is ramped up. There's no question about it. And if you remember it, it's, it's like basically two sections. There's a buildup and then kind of the second half of the tribulation period is when all hell hits earth type of thing. So the first the first segment of it, the first three and a half years, so to speak, quote unquote, is just a build up period where everything keeps getting more and more intense and then it gets off the charts. Um, but this is just so fascinating to see these type of admissions come out. So astronomers using the National Science Foundation's Carl G. Jonsky's Very Large Array, VLA, have made the first radio telescope detection of a planetary mass object beyond our solar system, the object about a dozen times more massive than Jupiter, is a surprisingly strong magnetic powerhouse and a rogue. There's that word, rogue. Think about Star Wars. We had Star Wars Rogue One. I mean, all these... There's all these hints, a rogue system that comes in at a different angle than the other ones. And, you know, think about this, you know, an object 12 times the size of Jupiter. And um, supposedly it's out there that far. Is it really that far? Is it already right here? You know, is where is it? Is it somewhere around the uh, orbit of Mars? And so, so many people will say, well, it couldn't be here, it couldn't be there, because we know this, we know that. This is a scientific fact. But when you look at things, these scientific facts, quote-unquote, change every day. And, and things that we were to told and, and sold, you know, in, um, say, the 60s, the 70s, and the 80s, you know, they're, they're just, they're outdated. We know that they're incorrect. And for sure, everything changed tremendously when we discovered quantum physics. So this is all just so fascinating. So this object's right at the boundary between a planet and a brown dwarf, or a failed star, and it's giving us some surprises that can actually potentially help us to understand the magnetic processes on both stars and planets, said Melody Cow, who led the study while a graduate student at Caltech, and now is a Hubble postdoctoral fellow at Arizona State University. Brown dwarfs are objects too massive to be considered planets, yet not massive enough to sustain nuclear fusion of hydrogen at their cores, the process that powers stars. And that, again, we're looking at the old science, or the current science, which may end up being outdated at, at some point as, as people start to understand the electric universe deeper and deeper. And, and the magnetism and the electromagnetism between the bodies, which might actually be the driving um, the driving engine for, for the processes that were giving uh, nuclear fusion the credit. So it's very interesting. So they were originally thought not to emit radio waves, but in 2001, a VLA discovery of a radio flaring in one revealed strong magnetic activity. Subsequent observations showed that some brown dwarfs have strong aur auroras, similar to that seen in our own solar system's giant planets. The auroras seen on Earth are caused by our planet's magnetic field interacting with the solar wind. However, solitary brown dwarfs do not have a solar wind from a nearby star to interact with. How, how the auroras are caused in brown dwarfs are unclear. But the scientists think one possibility is an orbiting planet or moon interacting with the brown dwarf's magnetic field, such as what happens between Jupiter and its moon Io. The strange object in the latest study, called SIMP, and it gives you a series of numbers and letter, has a magnetic field more than 200 times stronger than Jupiter's. The object was originally detected in 2016 as one of five brown dwarfs the study, scientists studied with the VLA to gain knowledge about the magnetic fields and the mechanisms by which some of the coolest such objects can produce strong radio emissions. Brown dwarf masses are notoriously difficult to measure, and at that time the object was thought to be an old and much more massive brown dwarf. Last year, an independent team of scientists discovered that it was part of a very young group of stars. Its young age meant that it was in fact so much less massive that it could be a free-floating planet. 
only 12.7 times more massive than Jupiter, with a radius 1.22 times that of Jupiter. At 200 million years old and 20 light years from Earth, the object had a surface temperature of about 825 degrees Celsius, or more than 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. By comparison, the sun's surface temperature is about 5500 degrees Celsius. The difference between a gas giant planet and a brown dwarf remains hotly debated amongst astronomers, but one rule of thumb that astronomers use is the mass below which deuterium, deuterium fusion ceases, known as the deuterium burning limit, about 13 Jupiter masses. Simultaneously, the Caltech team that originally detected its radio emission in 2016 has observed it again in yet a new study at even higher radio frequencies and confirmed that its magnetic field was even stronger than first measured. When it was announced that it had a mass near deuterium burning limit, I had just finished analyzing the newest VLA data. The VLA observations provided both the first radio detection and the first measurement of the magnetic field of a possible planetary mass object beyond the solar system. Such a strong magnetic field presents huge challenges to the understanding of the dynamo mechanism that produces the magnetic fields in brown dwarfs and exoplanets and helps drive the auroras we see, says Greg Hallinan of Caltech. This particular object is exciting because studying its magnetic dynamo mechanisms can give us new insights into how the same type of mechanisms can operate in extrasolar planets, planets beyond our solar system. We think these mechanisms can work not only in brown dwarfs, but also in gas giants and terrestrial planets. So we may have a new way of detecting exoplanets, including the elusive rogue ones, not just orbiting a planet star, the rogue ones, rogue ones. <laughs> so it's all pretty interesting stuff. And so here they have stuff, they have now, you know, an object that is so much like what we have been talking about with Nibiru and, and Planet X and the type of a, a rogue thing that's somewhere between a planet and a brown dwarf. Uh, and here they are just exposing it. It's like they're, they're flashing us in a way, a, a glimpse of the reality, but not giving us anything definitive, of course. Yet, do they know definitively? I, I bet you the ones in the highest places know everything pretty much they know exactly what's going on and so at Kilauea with the eruption it sets a record new lava landmass grows as we were saying and now of course they're going to be faced with potential of a hurricane coming or a series of hurricanes but this is Kilauea's longest eruption ever in the lower rift zone east rift zone the record was previously set in 1955 at least 24 different vents opened Along a nine-mile stretch during that particular eruption, this eruption this year has opened 24 events, with only one being active right now, which we know, Fisher 8. <clears throat> the eruption has also resulted in lava covering a total of 585 acres of new land, where previously there was just ocean. This is almost an entire square mile of added land mass, which keeps growing further every day, and there's no way of telling when the current eruption will end. That's been going on since May 3rd. So we are into month four, or month three, my friends. My math, I need more coffee. It's month three, and Kilauea is going, and Hawaii is getting bigger, and we're watching the Earth get redone. We're watching all sorts of crazy stuff. I mean, talk about crazy signs in the sky. Uh, and here is just one more little thing that they're admitting to, and uh, this is something the Dutch sense has been saying since whenever he started with what he's doing. Uh, I've only been watching them for maybe a year and a half now. Uh, but earthquakes can systematically trigger other ones on the opposite side of the Earth. And so, there you go. So, this is what Dutch has been saying all along. And it's obvious. I mean, it's just an energy transfer thing. If you just listen to what he says, then it's so easy to just go and look, look at the map, see where things are happening, look at the depth, and you just know the way energy transfers. So it's so easy to figure what's going to kind of come next. It really is not anything too complicated. But here now they're admitting that, yes, 
Earthquakes can systematically trigger other ones, even on the opposite side of the Earth. So just one more thing that's getting admitted to after you know being so vilified. Uh, it's, it's just hilarious, really, when you get down to it. Massive flotilla of putrid seaweed washing up in the Caribbean and South Florida, threatening beaches as we see them making their way through all the sargassum with seaweed. And this is in Sunny Isles Beach in Florida. <clears throat> and I'll tell you, um, yeah, so many people I'm talking to down here, you, you have to escape being right on the water because it's just brutal. It's, it's just so toxic with the red tide. And then you have all this um, sargassum blooms as well, which it's abundant in the ocean, originates from the Sargasso Sea, a region in the North Atlantic. The seaweed forms floating rafts that can stretch for miles. The leaves and branches contain gas-filled berry-like structures called pneuma pneumatocysts that make the plants buoyant and able to float on the surface of the seawater. The floating masses of sargassum provide an essential habitat for fish, sea turtles, birds, and hundreds of other sea creatures. But in recent years, sargassum has been washing up on shores in mass quantities, creating smelly piles on beaches and distressing tourists. The Caribbean has been the hardest hit, but sargassum has become a nu nuisance in Florida and off the west coast of Africa as well. While normally harmless to humans, when it washes up on shore, the seaweed and animals contained within quickly begin to die, decompose, leaving a rotten egg smell in its wake. And, and this could actually cause you to get sick, and that's, that's part, of, um, part of everything that we're understanding. Um, because there's just all this nastiness down there right now. So I don't know when I'm heading back down in that direction because it's, it's still nasty down there. As we see all the poisoning of the earth and the toxins. And meanwhile, we have Princess Madeline of Sweden, and she's officially moving to Florida. So we have some of the royal family coming to Florida. She and her family are heading stateside in the fall. And we see her and her beautiful family. And they are coming to Florida this fall. And they don't know exactly where they're going to be living yet. But they are going to become Floridians. So that's kind of interesting to think of it. Because some of you were, were bringing this up. And saying, well, what's part of the royal family, right? And we know the royal family must have some inside knowledge on what's going on with earth changes and stuff. So why are they coming to Florida? Moving from Sweden to Florida. Well, what you guys think? Give me your opinions. And um, we've seen a lot of distress in creatures and in, especially in the sea lately. And here we have a 10-foot shark terrifying tourists and shutting down a beach after being attacked by a ray. So this shark actually ended up getting the uh, the short side of the straw in a fight with the manta ray. And uh, it actually took a barb in the nose, which then caused it to get all disorientated. So if you are ever attacked by a shark, hit them in the nose. It is true. That's where all the nerve endings are. And so as I lost that there, um, and this case this shark ended up basically dying from that battle because it was so disorientated it could not figure out how to swim back out into the water and eventually uh people on the beach killed it because it was just hanging there up close by everybody and there's a video for you guys to check out there as well and this is creepy as can be. And this is Big Big Brother at its worst. China launching high-tech bird drones to watch over its citizens. They're called doves and they don't come in peace. And they don't even look too realistic. But hey, you know, if you're, if you're not really thinking about the fact that some of those birds might not be birds and they might actually be drones spying on you, following you, well, maybe you won't notice. Look up there, a pretty little bird gliding majestically through the sky, encapsulating the beauty of nature? Wait a minute. It's a high-tech surveillance drone. Over recent years, more than 30 Chinese military and government agencies have been reportedly using drones made to look like birds to surveil citizens in at least five provinces, according to the South China Morning Post. 
The program is reportedly codenamed Dove and run by Song Bai Fen, a professor at Northwestern Polytechnical University in Xi'an. Song was formerly a senior scientist on the Chengdu J-20, Asia's fifth generation stealth fighting jet. Bird-like drones mimic the flapping of wings of a real bird using a pair of crank rockers driven by an electric motor. Each drone has a high-definition camera, GPS antenna, flight control system, and a data link with satellite communication possibility. And while the scale is still small, I believe the technology has good potential for large-scale use in the future. It has some unique advantages to meet the demand for drones in the military and civilian sectors. So that is something to be uh, very, very aware of. And I don't know if I shared with you guys, but a long time ago, back when I was 19, and it was per when I had that first time I ever had a dream of a kind of alien invasion type dream. Um, <clears throat> I dreamed that there was these floating eyes that watched people everywhere. And they were at all the intersections. They were over crowds everywhere. They, were, they just looked like they were glass encased eyes almost. But I didn't know what they were, you know, back then in, uh, gosh, that was 19, mid 80s. Um, but now I could clearly see they were drones. They were totally drones. They were drones that were everywhere watching everything we do. And that's the society that we are starting to live in. And that is the society that we will have in the very near future. And we could see this is a clear indication of it. Astronomers blown away by a historic stellar blast. And so we keep learning about more about all these um, explosions, stellar explosions, cosmic explosions, and these particles that could be here in just seconds from, you know, long distance away. Imagine traveling the moon in 20 seconds. That's how fast material from a 170-year-old stellar eruption sped away from the unstable, eruptive, and extremely massive star ETA, Korea, Karine. Yeah, that's, that's a huge one, and it just dwarfs our star, uh, just like the Earth is dwarfed by the sun. So astronomers conclude this is the fastest jettison gas ever measured from a stellar outburst that didn't result in complete annihilation of the star. The blast from the most luminous star known in our galaxy released almost as much energy as a typical supernova explosion would have left behind a stellar corpse, however. And now in this case, a double star system remained and played a critical role in circumstances that led to the colossal blast. Over the past seven years, a team of astronomers led by Nathan Smith of the University of Arizona and Armin Rust of the Space Telescope Science Institute determined the extent of this extreme stellar blast by observing light echoes from ETA, Carinae, and its surrounding. And um, I'll let you guys finish reading it, but it's, it's just another amazing... I mean, when you look at these images, they're just incredible. And it really does feel like we're living inside the mind of God, really, when you, when you think about it. How to do a parasite cleanse with herbs and natural foods. And, and this is something that we don't want to think about, but just to give you, for instance, it, it's estimated that as many as 10 to 15% of us walking around have ringworms. And you know what? We all have thousands of types of parasites that live in us or on us. It's pretty gross, isn't it, to think about it? Um, parasitic infections can be responsible for dozens and dozens of symptoms from coughing, unexplained weight loss, to insomnia, even blindness. Even scarier, you might have no symptoms at all. So could you have a parasite? Some common risk factors for par parasitic infections include eating raw or undercooked fish or meat. Sorry, sushi lovers. International travel, especially to developing countries. Frequently swimming in lakes, rivers, or streams, close contact with children, pets, and insects, poor hygiene, hand washing, compromised immune system, poverty and malnutrition, a hot and humid climate, handling kitty litter. How do I know if I have a parasite? Confirming the presence of parasites usually requires blood or stool tests, endoscopies, colonoscopies, x-rays, MRIs, CAT scans. They can all identify a parasitic inf infection. But you don't have to be diagnosed with parasites to do full body cleanse. Please note, always consult your healthcare professional before doing any type of cleanse. 
If you suspect you might have parasites, contact a professional right away so you can be tested and get the appropriate medical care. And there's no parasite cleanse that's 100% effective. But this gives you some options. Now you could use any and all of these. And I'll tell you the one that I've seen the most is black walnut hulls, wormwood extract, and cloves. And you, those three together make a beautiful, potent, um, anti-parasitic uh, triad that will do wonders. Grapefruit seed extract is also very effective as well as especially uh, oregano and oil of oregano, garlic, garlic extract, ginger, papaya juice, coconut oil, apple cider vinegar, and, and none of these things are going to really harm you. Um, the only thing that you know you would be maybe a little bit more cautious with would be massive doses of wormwood. Um, but on the whole, I mean, all these are very, very safe. They're not going to give you the other issues you're going to find with so many drugs. And, you know, it's so effective. You know, coconut oil should be in your toothpaste. I mean, it's just, it's, it's so good for you. It really, really is. Um, there's so many uses for all these natural things. But as far as a parasite cleanse, these are all very anti-parasitic. And we should be doing these type of things on a regular basis, not necessarily a whole parasitic cleanse, you know, like every every week or anything like that, but just as a good procedure, um, it, it all depends on where you are, how active you are, how out outdoors you are. Um, gosh, after swimming in uh, the Gulf, yeah, it makes me want to do a parasite cleanse <laughs> for sure. But if you're exposing yourself to some of these things, like if you're eating garlic and ginger on a regular basis, using coconut oil on a regular basis, many people will, will put apple cider vinegar or take it internally on a daily basis. All these things could definitely help to keep you healthy and balanced and basically keep the parasite issue in check. So plant-based foods aren't just for vegans anymore. And actually plant-based food sales have grown 20% over just the past year, according to new data. So you're seeing more and more non-meat alternatives coming on out. And so many people are so paranoid about, how do I get my protein if I don't eat meat? I can't get protein. Well, I mean, if you're a vegetarian, quote unquote, it's cake to get protein. Um, it, it's, there's no issues in that at all. If you could take in things like Greek yogurt, eggs, cheese, I mean, there's tons and tons of protein in, in those things. Now, if you're going to go vegan, it gets a little bit tougher, but it's still really not even that hard. I, I mean, I have um, a shake most mornings that I make with fresh juice, and I always put fresh ginger in it. I'll, I'll juice like a good one inch by inch and a half uh, piece of fresh ginger in there, as well as a variety of different fresh juices. And then I'll usually put a greens formula in it, and I'll add some aloe vera juice to it. And aloe is so soothing and, and also very, very alkalizing. Um, and then because I'm a male in, in the uh, time frame where you tend to lose some testosterone, I'll, I'll add uh, long jacks, which is Tonkat Ali and horny goat weed, and those are um, testosterone boosters. So they will boost your testosterone, which, you know, in a male that's over 35, it'll give you more energy. It'll also help with fat burning, um, as well as, you know, it's a little bit of a, a mood booster as well. So I'll add those type of things to it. And then I'll add basically anywhere from 25 to 50 grams of vegetable protein. If I was going to go to the gym, uh, then I'd probably do uh, two scoops, like 50 grams. And if I'm not going to the gym that day, I'll just do one scoop. Um, which would be for me 25 grams. Now, now realize like a, if you're looking at the USRDA, which is debatable for a woman, you don't, you know, they're going to recommend maybe 35 to 40 grams of protein a day for a guy, maybe 55 grams of protein. It really doesn't take that much to add up to that. It really doesn't. Now, if you're vegan, yeah, it takes a little bit more, but it's still not hard. I mean, just say with that shake. You know, even even as a male and I'm only taking in one scoop, I still have, you know, half roughly of the protein I need for the whole day. And when we look at like what's in so many of the wraps and in so many of the, um, you know, if you're going to be eating different types of pastas, they have like red lentil pasta, which has a lot of protein in it. And I mean, there's just so many different, you know, foods that we could look at. 
that would add protein. I mean, just, just in regular beans and lentils, um, you combine that with rice, you get complete proteins. Um, there's, there's so many different ways to get protein. So plenty of options. But the thing is here that there are, the public is demanding uh, more options. So always be careful. Look, make sure that you're not taking in GMO um, soy, things like that, which could cause all, so all sorts of inflammation and issues. Um, but there are so many alternatives now to meat because more and more people all the time are dropping meat. They're just not feeling like eating meat anymore. And so it's, there's more options becoming available. So what doctors say are CBD's benefits observed in actual people and not mice? There's um, definitely, no defini definitely no lack of anecdotal stories about the benefits of CBD, which is a chemical compound in the cannabis plant. As a result, companies are flocking to offer hemp-derived CBD products to help with such ailments as pain, addiction, stress, and anxiety. Now, unfortunately, there's only a few human clinical studies that confirm its benefits. But it's exciting to hear medical professionals share their opinion about the effectiveness of CBD on actual people. And, uh, you know, th there are so many uh, medical professionals that are coming out and talking about its benefits. And uh, we know that, as we have talked about before, there's, there's a whole CBD system in our bodies that's there. So obviously we have used it probably for thousands or tens of thousands of years. As, as a medicine, and, and perhaps even in other ways as well. Um, you just don't have a whole system in the human body developed to accept CBD if it wasn't used in the past. It's definitely an effective pa pain reliever, and one of the things that it um, definitely does is, you know, it helps with depression, anxiety, and stress, and it's also anti-inflammatory, and when you get down to it, you could tie in almost every disease to inflammation, you know, if not all, when you get down to it. it, it inflammation is one of the biggest things we have to keep under control in the body. And so CBD could definitely help with that. It's um, promising for many skin ailments as well, including ac uh, acne. But as we're seeing here, inflammation affects all of our organs and, as, and can lead to many ailments and diseases. This doesn't exclude the skin, which is our biggest organ. Interestingly, the skin has the most cannabinoid receptors, similar to ones in the brain. So this makes CBD a promising remedy for skin problems. And demand's growing, and they're making money on it, so they're now they're going to push it. And same thing with medical marijuana. You know, as soon as the big companies have the ability to make money on it and then start to squeeze out everybody else so that they're going to make all the money, uh, then it'll be full bore, go ahead. And so, as we know, and know many of you guys know the benefits of CPT. So, my friends, as always, please do thumbs up to support the channel, subscribe, and, and grow with this growing family. Let's reach 30,000 subscribers in the next uh, nine days. Let's see if we could do it. I think we could do it. So, share, 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 and let us share our knowledge with people that are not of our tribe and pull them into our tribe as our tribe grows and we wake up more and more people to all the possibilities out there. <clears throat> it's really an amazing time. And when I was a little kid, just to share with you, uh, and, and I was feeling mortality, uh, because as I said, my, my brother died when I was five. I remember, um, and this is probably a weird thing for a kid to say, saying, I, I don't mind having to die, but I just want to know everything. So if I could die and on the other side, know everything, all the mysteries, I want to know everything from exactly what is Bigfoot to, you know, give me a breakdown on all the alien races to how many dimensions are there exactly? Um, you know, these are the questions that I have and I just want those things answered. And it's so exciting to see that we're living in these times where we're, we're starting to see things unravel. All the mysteries are unraveling and we're starting to realize exactly, you know, what life is, who we are, what we are. And it's not what we were told we are. We are so much more than what we've been led to believe that we are. So my friends, as always, thumbs up to support the channel. May you guys be blessed with abundant peace, health, well-being, love, and all good things, and always be kept safe in these times. 
God bless my friends. Namaste.